Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for this webinar on the post-pandemic public. Sharon Har will kick us off here in a minute. I just wanted to let you know that uh, you can receive 1.5 learning units of HSW credit from the AIA CES program. This course has been registered. You can email me, Michael Monti. My email address is in the registration info that was sent to you if you have any questions. We will follow up with people who indicated they want continuing education credits and gave us their AIA number or just told us that they want to. But otherwise, you can email me. So again, thank you for joining us and Sharon Hart can take it away. Okay. And All right, and let me just uh, put this in full screen, see if it works. And while I'm doing that, just welcome everyone. Um, okay, um, is everyone uh, seeing my screen? Yes. Great. Um, uh, so, uh, I am, um, well, first of all, um, welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us um, this evening in what I expect will be a really exciting uh, conversation. Um, I wanted just to start um, not by reading uh, the ACSA call to action uh, to seek a more equitable future. Uh, it's a lengthy but really important document, but to point uh, to its presence, um, many of you may have just received an email uh, pointing to uh, providing this statement and also pointing to the ACSA website. And I've also uh, put the, um, I've put the uh, URL in the chat for those of you who um, have not yet seen that. Uh, I know that the ACSA board and Mike Monty, the executive director, have been engaged in a conversation about this statement uh, for the past couple of days, um, working on it and refining it. And um, I think it's particularly prescient to today's uh, conversation. So um, I'll you know, just recommend that people go to see it themselves and perhaps maybe uh, in the Q&A, we can make reference to it as well. Um, so when um, I uh, put together this panel, and I, I really want to thank both Mike Monty and Daniel Friedman for inviting me to organize this, um, I um, wrote the following statement, uh, which was rather brief, um, and it's, uh, how do we frame our approach to public space in the immediate post-pandemic future and beyond? Um, and in true sort of AIA learning objective uh, fashion, um, the following was panelists will present current projects and speculate how they might or not reassess and revalue these moving forward. Uh, while questioning past practice, this topic holds open the possibility that future thinking and restructuring might bring more public into the design of urban space. Um, and as you can imagine, this brief webinar description was written in a spirit of, I'm, I will honestly say, optimism, asking what role public space can play in reconceptualizing the public. Uh, while Zoom has created new audiences and new ways we can speak together from atomized locations, it is not a space of appearance where we can all act together. I believe this is even more true today as the country in public is once again forced to contemplate what the president of the University of Michigan, Mark Schlissel, who's himself an immunologist, refers to as, and this is a quote from him, the persistent and appalling pestilence of racism. I like his use of the term pestilence because it disaggregates the current global outbreak of COVID-19 from the vir virulence and devastation that is inherent in the persistent spatialized racism and violence that architecture, urban design, and urban planning have helped to create and perpetuate. And it also shows us that social media and virtual space are not enough to call attention to and act upon injustice. Finally, it also indicates that we need public space in order to properly be together. 
So the extent to which the pandemic makes vivid the unequal access to and treatment within public space people of color, so too does a response require that we rebuild and build anew the parks, squares, infrastructures, and community spaces necessary for public life. And um, I'd really like that to be my very brief uh, introduction to this um, and leave most of the conversation or the presentation to our five really accomplished speakers uh, whose uh, bios are here up on the screen for you to quickly look at and also available on the ACSA website. Uh, we are going to proceed in reverse alphabetical order uh, with Georgine Theodore from NJIT and Interboro, Anya Sorota from um, uh, the University of Michigan and Akoaki, Brian McGrath from Parsons School of Design, Nancy Levinson from Places Journal, and last but not least, my former colleague David Brown from University of Illinois at Chicago. And I am going to stop sharing my screen and ask each of them to uh, share their screen as appropriate, and I will watch uh, the proceedings. Um, we will uh, hopefully uh, maybe just among ourselves, myself and the five speakers have a little bit of conversation after their presentation um, and really leave as much time as possible in the end for questions and answers uh, and further you know, just discussion. Uh, I'll discuss a little bit more after the presentations how we might go about in a somewhat orderly fashion uh, making that all happen. So with that, I will stop sharing my screen. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you see my screen full screen? I can. Okay, so I'll get started then. Um, thank you, Sharon, for this invitation. It's um, an honor to be here. I'd also like to thank uh, Michael Monty from the ACSA and Daniel Freedom also for this invitation. Um, happy to be a part of this. Um, so uh, to contextualize my presentation, um, I'd like to first talk about three parallel and interrelated tracks in my work um, and how these tracks have shaped my thinking about public space. Uh, so the first track is teaching. Um, as you know, I'm a professor at NGIT and the director of our Master of Infrastructure Planning Program. And in my teaching, uh, both in my studios and my seminars, I'm dealing directly with questions of public space, not only through designing public space, but designing processes and tools that bring different publics together. The second track is practicing. I'm a principal and co-founder of Interborough Partners. It's an architecture, urban design, and planning firm that I co-founded with Tidius Amborst and Daniel Dioka. And we have designed and built uh, many public spaces over the years. Um, these are projects that range in scale from a piece of furniture, uh, what you could call the, the designed object, to plazas and squares. up to uh, large, uh, large landscapes um, and uh, regional landscapes. Then the third track, the third track is researching. And in our work um, in the public realm, it's really strongly shaped by our research. And I point to the Arsenal of Exclusion and Inclusion, uh, the book I co-authored and edited with my partners as an example of this third track. Um, but in the end, uh, the clear distinctions between these tracks um, are always shifting and the relationship between research and design, between reflection and projection, and between the very large scale um, and the very small scale is renegotiated 
and redefined in every specific instance. So Sharon um, asked us to talk about one project, um, and I'd like to focus on the Arsenal, um, a long range project in which these distinctions are completely uh, blurred. So um, what is the arsenal of exclusion and inclusion, you might ask? Um, it's, it's really a field guide to what we call weapons of exclusion and inclusion. Uh, the sometimes imperceptible codes, conventions, rules, practices, and physical artifacts that shape the contemporary city, making it more um, accessible or more closed off for different people, often based on who these people are and what they look like. And in the arsenal, uh, we have 163 weapons, all of them in one illustration, uh, which you can see here. Um, and in the book, we examine how they've been used by different actors in the United States to either um, restrict or increase access to urban space. Um, we assess the effects and the legacies of these weapons, and we uh, speculate on how they might be deployed or retired to make more open cities in which people feel more welcome in spaces. Um, and so each one of these weapons comes with a definition, a short article. Here you can see the entire list. Um, and the entries were written by us, um, uh, uh, Interborough, but also um, quite impressive list of uh, urban historians, practitioners, sociologists, scholars of law and science. Um, and um, I'd like to show you a sample of some of these, um, these entries and unpack it a little bit. Um, so the, um, there are these tools that selectively um, exclude people from access to urban space, uh, ranging from everyday artifacts, such as the armrest on public benches. These are really to keep people from sleeping there along with tools that are meant to keep homeless people away, such as feeding bans, camping ordinances, sidewalk sitting bans. These are tools that deny access to parts of the city directly through barriers, um, like the, um, uh, like say for example, uh, residential parking permits um, in cities such as LA. And of course, um, all sorts of contemporary and historical zoning codes mortgage discrimination, financial schemes, and then also tools to bar certain types of behavior in public space, um, either through things like no loitering zones or no cruising zones, uh, to banning certain types of things like classical music, which are piped to, um, in outdoor speakers and shopping malls to frighten off um, skateboarders. And then also the counter tools, these are things that um, give access uh, to the city. These are policy tools such as inclusionary zoning, uh, the Fair Housing Act, and also new inventive things such as this um, map by the LA Urban Rangers. And this was a map to inform people about how to access uh, to the privatized beaches of uh, Malib Malibu. And this is done by like, you know, walking over wet sand, which is always public, uh, sometimes by swimming around a fence um, and just basically giving people the right to what um, is, is uh, giving them the information to get to what is rightfully theirs. So, um, so clearly, since we wrote this, there's um, an astonishing amount of new material. Um, we published this three and a half years ago and um, the book sold out and we are now preparing a second edition. And as we've been writing uh, the preface, we've been asking ourselves what should be updated? Um, what should we change? Uh, should we add new entries? So Sharon's uh, prompt here is like exactly what we've been doing. So I was really um, happy to sort of continue along that, uh, that thought process. And since we uh, started working on this project, actually back in 2008, We've seen a significant shift in the discipline, discipline's boundaries. Uh, when we started the project, there was less of an understanding of architecture as fundamentally political. And this has really shifted. I want everybody to sort of think back a little bit uh, to, uh, you know, uh, 12 years ago. This has really shifted. And even uh, today, like in the darkest corners of like, you know, uh, pure formalism, we see gestures nowadays that reflect an understanding that all architecture is political and not autonomous. And this is really a good thing. And I think we see that shift impacting architectural education as well. 
Um, and that shift now really changes the readings of some of the weapons that we featured. When we started, it was still surprising to think of a bathroom, a public bathroom, as a political artifact. Um, but now that has very much become part of mainstream reality, where it's been used as both a tool of exclusion and inclusion. And some weapons uh, that we included, they really have a very, very long arc. Uh, they continue to be central in the battlefield. Uh, for example, the Trump administration has sought to undermine the Fair Housing Act. This is one of the arsenal's key weapons of inclusion and is really the foundation for many other progressive policies. And then some weapons have really just been turned completely upside down and inside out. And we've really seen this in the COVID epidemic, uh, pandemic. Um, actions such as the removal um, of street furniture, the closing of playgrounds, um, these were um, in the past expressions of exclusion. Now they can possibly be read as signs of care. Or maybe not. So formerly heterogeneous and inclusive spaces, such as the New York City subway, which we featured um, in our, our entry flat fair, it's presently quite different um, and has shifted our questions from who has access to public space to who has the resources not to be in public. So we've seen in the COVID crisis, the most vulnerable are at the greatest risk. And much of this vulnerability is rooted in spatial issues, such as who gets to live where, who has access to healthcare and education, and who is exposed to the most pollution and so on. So I'd like to end with, the reading, with a reading of a list of the weapons from our book that have been in my mind in the past few days, weapons that have restricted peoples of color um, access to space. Blockbusting, blood, bomb, busing, cold water, contract selling, expulsive zoning, Jim Crow laws, Fair Housing Act, freeway, hoop, racial deed restriction, racial steering, racial zoning, residential security map, Saggy pants ban, stop question and frisk, siren, school district, urban renewal, wall, youth curfew. Thank you. Thank you for that, Georgina. Um, and thank you for, th this is Anya Sirota speaking. Um, thank you for the invitation to participate in this conversation. Um, when I read the prompt, I couldn't think of a topic that was more pressing in our own um, professional conundrum uh, than the question of how we as um, agents of change and turmoil and struggle will occupy the public realm um, given the health crisis, but also um, given the political crisis of our time. Um, so thank you again for the invitation. I'll try to figure out how to share quickly. Does that work? Great. Um, so, again, my name is Anya Sirota, and I uh, teach at the University of Michigan at Taubman College, and I'm also a principal of a um, design firm called Akoaiki. And um, to be perfectly frank, um, what we've done for the past, uh, I guess, decade or so now is we focused on making objects and cultivating processes in order to make crowds and then to have those crowds make a case for permanent cultural infrastructure and investment in the public realm. And so what we've become very um, focused on is illustrating that there is 
the possibility for radical social mixity, for space creation, ephemeral as, as, as it is, in scenarios where uh, disinvestment um, in public infrastructure has continued for a certain span to be the status quo of how, um, of, of how government uh, or investment deals with public space. So we've created objects like the mothership, which we launched in an unmarked garage uh, that invited over 700 residents uh, to experience um, uh, a, a concert uh, with 12 former members of Parliament Funkadelic and the proximity of everyone to each other and the capacity to uh, experience a collective uh, social environment was for us the material with which we documented the possibility of investment um, in the neighborhood. Other experiments that we've conducted uh, relate to preservation and a kind of advocacy for the reimagination of private space as public realm environments. And we've created things like uh, galleries atop the Packard plant uh, where we invited residents, scrappers, um, architects and uh, other professionals to speculate about the future possibilities for a public reimagination of an industrial an, uh, infrastructure uh, that's both icon iconic because of its uh, ruined condition and deeply problematic uh, because of its scale and position in the city. We've created uh, temporary cultural infrastructures uh, clip-on uh, temporary institutions, uh, such as the Detroit uh, Arts Council, um, an arch that attaches itself to underused uh, spaces in the city in order to begin to cultivate conversations about um, what the future of the city might look like. We've created operas and um, other stage sets in order to imagine what uh, underused uh, landscapes might offer for both social experience, but also cultural expression. And we've invited a plethora of international crowds to experience the value and capacity of artists from Detroit um, as instigators of this reevaluation of the public realm. And we've used these techniques in order to begin uh, master planning processes and other urban scaled, neighborhood scaled uh, efforts. Um, for example, working with the Oakland Avenue Urban Farm in Detroit's North End, we've made a case for being able to curate and cultivate uh, temporary but highly dense social experiences, again, in order to recount the narrative of place uh, when um, others might not see the value of investment and the preservation of the social and cultural activity that, ha that happens there. Even so far, our, our own office, which we started with the firm Agence Terre, uh, is a kind of crowd-making experience for us where uh, community engagement and public engagement is at the forefront of the work that we do. Um, and so we're, we're always investing in the possibility of space communicating the future of uh, our design initiatives. And I, I think I just realized that <laughs> this is in the, in the way. Um, more recently, uh, we have begun working on a project uh, at the urban scale where a year ago we won a competition for the redesign of uh, Detroit's cultural district. And um, the cultural district is composed of a number of autonomous institutions, very storied institutions, each with its own idiosyncratic um, capacities, uh, programs, um, value systems, aesthetics. Uh, and there are 12 of them in all, including the Detroit Institute of Art, the Detroit Public Library, uh, venerable, uh, you know, impressive institutions like the Charles H. Wright Museum of African American History. And then there are smaller scale institutions in the mix as well, such as the Hellenic Museum or the International Center for um, Recent uh, Immigrants to the U.S. And so our task in this project 
uh, was to propose a way that we might be able to unify all of these disparate actors and create a sense of place through the design of the public realm, the connective tissue between the institutions, which currently sides with a kind of uh, modernist tabula rasa individuation between the institutions. And so what we, um, what we suggested and what we proposed was a kind of diagram, a diagram that was composed of a number of shared parts. And the idea was that um, if the institutions might come together to determine how those elements in the landscape might be shared, then we would arrive at a master plan down the, the line. And so rather than propose a kind of formal iteration of what the landscape would look like, we offered a number of ingredients. And those ingredients we suggested would need to be resolved, iterated, adjusted, and nuanced over time. But essentially, what we made an argument for was the ephemeral densification of the district through a number of curated and um, calibrated activities that we believed would bring everyone together in unprecedented ways and respond to the question of distanciation and de-densification, even for a brief period of time, uh, creating a sort of um, urban experience where social mixity would be at the forefront of the organizational premise of the experience. And of course, now as we're working on this project and these elements and how they're supposed to work in the landscape, the big question that arises what is, of course, what will public engagement look like in this age where getting together and sitting at the table is no longer the norm. It is a kind of luxury and where the residents of Detroit might not have access to broadband or Wi-Fi. In fact, 40% do not. And so how do we begin what we believe is essential as an engagement process in order to nail um, the sensibility of place, the programmatic uh, value of the exterior experience, and how do we extend the thresholds of these institutions, individual institutions, into the landscape in order to create a more inclusive environment, one that um, is inviting for all. And so some of these elements that in the beginning of the project we believed would you know, orchestrate a kind of um, party palace of sorts have actually become elements that allow the landscape to function as um, an extension of the institution and allow these institutions to begin imagining opening their doors, however partially, and blending the things that they do within in order to engage the activities outside of, of in, 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 into the landscape. So here we are, this is, um, this is a project that's very much midway, mid progress. And um, we are, you know, on a daily basis, trying to understand what public investment is going to look like in the coming years and what public engagement is going to look like and who will have access to this, um, to this space and how will it be shared. Thanks. Hi, good evening. Um, really enjoyed both of those presentations. Um, I'm Brian McGrath. I'm from Parsons School of Design, um, and I'm speaking as a, a new teacher. Um, after 35 years in architectural academia, um, I've returned to teaching after a stint in administration. Um, so I, I'm going to show you work in all humility that's just beginning to reformulate myself as a, a, an architectural studio instructor. Uh, Parsons, um, as you may know, is a 5,000 student, uh, very diverse uh, school of design um, that's part of the new school, um, which is renowned for its School of Social Research. 
Um, and so it's a unique combination. We're half the university um, as a cohort of designers. And um, as, as Dean of the Parsons School of Constructed Environments, which is, has eight degree programs and four disciplines, um, I had the great joy of um, founding a Masters of Industrial Design program that's part of a school that has uh, architecture, interior design, product design, and lighting design. Um, and so that's what I, um, has, I've been obsessed with and the, the founding director of that program, Rama Korpash, calls it How We Make Makes the World. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, um, both, uh, well, I won't talk about how we made Parsons into a making center on Fifth Avenue, the, the boulevard known for consumption. Um, but, uh, and uh, remake a street seats project on Fifth Avenue every year now um, since that time. Um, but um, I, I wanna talk about um, um, making, making public. <laughs> uh, so with that, I'm gonna share my screen. See if I can find it right, here it is. Uh, so you can all see a website called Infrastructure, which I can't see right now, <laughs> Infrastructure Design and Justice Lab. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, so, um, so thank you, kudos uh, to Tommy Yang, and because of the pan pandemic, um, for the first time we haven't invested all our uh, sweat, blood, sweat, and tears in an end of year physical show. We actually have resources um, to uh, begin to uh, look at our teaching work online. Um, so this um, website collects um, uh, three years of BFA in architectural design studios and uh, two years of masters of architecture uh, uh, third year studios and both both studios are in the last year where um, the students um, are sort of testing their skills as architects at the urban scale um, and so um, as you see in this map um, we're we're drawing a blue line here um, that uh, doesn't touch Manhattan but uh, started in Newark last year uh, with a project um, uh, um, that uh, comes from um, my own 20 year experience of living in the Ironbound neighborhood and uh, partnership with um, Ana Batista, who teaches environmental justice, race, class, and environment at the new school. Um, and both of us has worked with the Ironbound Community Corporation um, and uh, on some of the most uh, toxic problems which confront this community because it's um, both the distribution center and the um, waste disposal of the largest consumer economy in the world, which is the New York City region. Um, and so starting from there, um, we've traced the uh, almost defunct freight rail line, which circles from um, Sunset Park, Brooklyn, through East New York, up through Astoria and to the South Bronx. Uh, a series of industrial zone sites and neighborhoods um, which are uh, sites of environmental justice. And so when I'm talking about making, making public, um, uh, I think um, this is the greatest um, uh, uh, spatial injustice problem uh, we have. And perhaps we need to talk about public space, not as a space of just um, leisure and consumption, but as a space of making. Um, so, uh, so, and, and I'll share in the chat the, the link to this. This is not public, so I ask you not to share publicly, but I'd love feedback from this conference if anyone wants to look more at it uh, after this. Um, but basically, um, the, it's a constellation of work that we hope to collect over uh, many years um, around issues of food, um, uh, you know, making everyday uh, consumer products um, around a, an idea of a commons, 
um, the afterlife of waste and rethinking logistics are, are the initial things. And so um, I, I can, if I have time, I'll go into uh, some of these links and, and show you. Um, and then as, as you see in the blue here, um, this is a, a kind of multi-year framework um, to engage many actors and community groups and city uh, and et cetera on um, multiple sites. So the, the first studio in Newark was taught with Peter Robinson and then Claire Weiss and Gracie Mills from WXY co-taught the New York based studio last year. Um, and so, um, so you can also go into any of these neighborhoods and find more about those projects. Um, but, but Sharon said she was most interested in me talking about the work I've been doing with the undergraduates, uh, which is uh, located in Chiang Mai, Thailand. And this is where I think um, maybe this idea of the publicness of making might be most resonant. Um, so this came from um, the sabbatical leave I enjoyed between um, serving as dean and going back to teaching. So I spent a year um, documenting um, urbanizing villages at the periphery of Chiang Mai, Thailand, which is a, a gorgeous place up in the mountains in northern Thailand. Um, but it's um, a, a vast um, a river valley that uh, uh, has for centuries annually flooded and uh, turned into rice cultivation uh, for subsistence farming. But now is the center of extreme tourism. Um, direct flights to Wuhan, uh, 3 million uh, tourists from China last year to the small city. Um, and, um, but uh, fortunately we, in January, the first week in January, we managed to go there uh, for nine days um, uh, as we did the past uh, two years um, for the third uh, uh, field work project there. Um, so uh, basically to jump into it in more detail because um, it's, if, if you look at the villages, um, I, you can see the pattern of urbanization of early development based on radial roads and then the construction of a ring road Brian, can, can, I'm going to interrupt for just a moment. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm the only one, but I'm not seeing any changes in your screen. Ah, uh -huh. I'm scrolling and I clicked on a link. No, we're still on uh, an, an old. I must have another window open. I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry. Maybe I'm going to stop share and reshare this one. Thank you for letting me know. I'm really sorry. It's probably been very mysterious. <laughs> Um, yeah, so here's, here's the Chiang Mai. Um, there's the urbanizing uh, uh, kind of paradise green valley. Can I draw? It, yeah. it could just be me, but I'm still seeing the Wix site. Huh. Yeah, I'm sorry. Maybe it's, it's not going to work. Um, I'm going to share the link because my time is almost up. And, and, um, but uh, the one issue, and I'm going to, maybe I'll go to the link and then stop sharing and show you one of these, these examples. Um, yeah, I've never tried to present off a live website before. Uh, can you see a, a village plan? So, um, so these villages are constituted by matrilineal compound houses where um, uh, extended families live, live um, traditionally in farm and craft production. And so the, um, the program has been to make both civic compounds, um, given that um, there's government money in bringing um, um, modern institutions to uh, the countryside, um, the urbanizing countryside, but also um, uh, uh, in this studio in particular, um, the design of, of uh, craft compounds. And so, um, uh, and this is a great COVID image, but this is how they make a, a tie dyed <laughs> um, uh, uh, t-shirts in this village. Um, this uh, Nama Khalid uh, did the design of a, a rice craft compound, all the byproducts of rice, um, et cetera. Um, so uh, I only have 30 seconds left, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop there, but again, I'll share this um, work in progress website. Um, but uh, I think my message is clear. 
Um, we had discussions about the bourgeois public sphere, the counter public sphere, and I'm really trying to um, uh, question our notion of public as for leisure and consumption and bring um, making into the public. Thank you. Oh, uh, it is a pleasure to be here. I'm going to start sharing my screen. Can you see that? Yeah. Is this happening? Can you see my screen? No. 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 Not yet. Okay. I'm going to. I think move it over here and I think it should work. Can you see it? No. No. Hmm. Okay. Let me see. Sorry about this. Can you see that? Anybody see that? Mm -mm. No, Sharon, can you? Um... Uh, one suggestion, if you have a second screen open, take you that might off. want to turn that one off. Got it, okay. Is that working? I'm not seeing it. Hmm. Damn. Hmm. Not even that? Something no. flashed. Yeah, something seemed to want to. Ah, yes. Um, I'm just going to leave it there and not try to do full screen. Just um, go with it. Okay. Um, okay, so it is a pleasure to be here. Um, sorry for the technical glitch. Um, it's great to participate in this timely conversation on the post-pandemic public. Uh, we've each been asked to present one project, and mine is Places Journal, a discursive public space. Publicness is, in fact, fundamental to our mission. It defines our very, let me see. It defines our very identity. Um, damn, this is not. It defines our very identity as a journal of public scholarship on architecture, landscape, and urbanism. Uh, an editorial space that's at once rigorous and accessible, that bridges from the academy to the profession to the public. Publicness also informs our platform. For the past decade, Places has been fully digital which means that our articles are instantly accessible to anybody with an internet connection, and also that they remain easily findable on our Explore page, which functions as a cross-referenced portal to more than 2,000 articles and counting. The goal of being public, of having a strong public presence, has also shaped our organizational model. We are an independent nonprofit supported by an international network of design faculties and by reader donations. This is an unusual and perhaps a unique business model, and it allows us to remain free of advertising and free of charge, publicly accessible with no paywall and no subscription. But most important of all, a commitment to publicness, to the concept of the public, drives our editorial agenda. Years ago, we put out a call for articles on the theme of public and private. We wanted to explore how this dynamic is shaping our politics and culture, and how it influences our buildings, cities, and landscapes. More specifically, we wanted to explore the fundamental realignment of the past half century, as the age of Roosevelt and the New Deal gave way to the age of Reagan, or to put it another way, as an era of high public responsibility, progressive taxation, and generous social provision gave way to our current era of limited government, low taxes, and public austerity. To date, we've published almost 100 articles on this theme, and the first by Georgine Theodore and her Interborough partners, 
explored the rise of diverse publics in everyday suburban places. The most recent by Johann Pries, Eric Johnson, and Don Mitchell argues that dedicated spaces for broad-based public assembly were essential to the rise of Swedish social democracy in the 20th century. Now, this issue of public assembly has of course gained terrible new urgency during the past few months of lockdown, and especially in the past week of nationwide political protest. As we are painfully aware here in the United States, the incoherent and inadequate federal response to the pandemic and to the murder of George Floyd can be seen as catastrophic evidence of the decline of our public systems and institutions, a decline brought about by powerful interests who have for decades sought to defund and delegitimate these systems and institutions. As the author Michael Lewis argues in The Fifth Risk, which I reviewed for places, the fundamental job mandate of government, of civil service, is to manage an immense portfolio of public risk. Risks that range from weather to warfare, housing to hunger, poverty to pandemic. In short, to keep us safe, healthy, and secure. In this light, it's clear that in America, the crisis of the pandemic is crashing into the crisis of public disinvestment, of which the Trump presidency is an extreme symptom. At Places Journal, a significant part of our editorial production, our public and private theme, has focused on the impacts of this, disinvest this disinvestment, and in particular, on rising inequality. We devoted a six-part series to inequality in American cities, including this article by Tom Beller on what he calls the invisible epidemic of lead poisoning the longest running child epide epidemic in US history, and one that disproportionately harms black children. We published an article by Sam Block that calls for shade to be understood as an index of inequality, a requirement for public health, and a new mandate for urban design. We focused on homelessness in America in this article by Chris Herring, and around the world in an essay by Arjun Apadurai. One of our most widely read articles by Shannon Mattern looks at the cultural underpinnings of the problem, arguing that in our fascination with innovation and disruption, we have as a nation neglected the values of maintenance and care. And here in another popular article, Billy Fleming makes the case for a renewed commitment to civil service and a new era of green public works. To mention just one more, editorial project. This spring, in response to the crisis, we published a new series, a six-part narrative survey in which several dozen academics shared brief personal perspectives on the sudden pivot to online instruction. The response was so strong that we have been, in, oh, excuse me. The response was so strong that we've been inspired to extend our investigation with a call for articles. And I'll note that our particular interest is not the uh, technological or logistical challenges of remote classrooms, but rather the potential threats to higher education as an essential public good. And on the subject of threat, I will conclude by emphasizing that here at places we work cross-sectionally across the spheres of architecture, landscape, and urbanism, of publishing and journalism, of academia and education. And at this moment in our history, and by that I mean our history as a nation, it seems that all these fears are to some degree endangered by the same forces that are diminishing and eroding our public realm. What this means for places is that we will redouble our efforts on behalf of the public realm, understood as physical space, as social ideal, and as political context. To me, this feels useful because I strongly believe that one aspect of the battle is narrative. The, the Reagan revolution was achieved in some significant measure because it told a story that many people found persuasive, a story about the value of free markets and private enterprise and individual initiative. So part of the challenge right now in building a better country and a real democracy is to tell a compelling new narrative of common interest collective welfare, and public good. Thank you.
Um, hi, I'm going to get ready to just go ahead and start to share my screen, but I want to thank everybody for their presentations and thank Sharon, Michael, and um, everyone from ACSA for inviting me. Um, so let's see, hopefully I can get this to work. I, can everybody see all right? Okay, thank you. Um, so what you're looking at here, um, so David Brown at UIC, uh, University of Illinois at Chicago. What I'm gonna talk about is really work that I'm currently doing in North Lawndale. Um, and it's in it, some ways it is, uh, what I'm going to talk about are somewhat three projects, but they're all to me one project in terms of they all have a relationship to the available city, which I'll talk about in one moment. But in some ways, what you see here in green is what I have initiated on my own um, in terms of continuing with the available city and the idea that it would transform from more of a kind of projective project about the possibility of vacant lots into an exposition model. So really working with different community organizations and then through work in North Lawndale have started to participate in some other, other projects that similarly look at vacant land. Um, I, when I say the available city, I am talking not just about the vacant land in the one neighborhood. Uh, North Lawndale has about 1000 vacant lots uh, currently, um, but across the city and principally on the west and south sides in primarily African American or Latino neighborhoods, uh, the city itself owns about 10,000 vacant lots. And when you think of that as an average lot, an aggregate, uh, you have something that's about the size of the loop itself. Uh, and so for me, there is an opportunity there to really begin to think about that vacant land or city owned vacant land as one system. Um, and in this case, one system of what I've termed collective space uh, rather than public space. Uh, and this is a project I've been working on for about 10 years now. Uh, in terming it collective space, I did want to uh, deliberately uh, get some distance from public space in terms of thinking through that they're or trying to think through possibilities for uh, uh, space that weren't necessarily um, connected to ideas about um, park and or plaza, which are maybe the immediate sensibilities about public space um, and that it could in fact be much more diverse. Um, and in this case actually could begin to provide a context for a neighborhood to have a lot of the amenities that it wouldn't have otherwise. Uh, and so here what you see um, on the left is really the idea that a, uh, you get it through community organizations have surfaces, which um, are really kind of small scale constructions on lots, and then also potentially have volumes of collective space within buildings um, that are on combinations of city owned vacant land and adjacent uh, private land. Um, so what you're seeing here is really just kind of different mod modalities in terms of possible densities uh, and in some ways um, extreme planting in the upper right of trees compared to garden compared to uh, high density development with kind of cultural spaces or uh, and then low density development with cultural spaces. Um, and so over the past two to three years I've really been trying to work with some uh, community organizations in North Lawndale. North Lawndale was chosen as the neighborhood to look at based off of the fact that I did an exhibit on the history of North Lawndale soon after I moved to Chicago in about 2005 or 2006. So I had some familiarity with it. Um, so really have worked to get to know different community organizations and individuals in North Lawndale and have talked with them about the project. So I was able to identify two sites uh, one with CCA Academy, a small, uh, a small um, charter school um, that's been there since about 1978. And then uh, the North Lawndale Greening Committee. Um, and so, uh, which runs a garden, one garden called MLK District Garden, but is actually a group that has about 35 community gardens or a, a kind of consortium of about 35 community gardens. 
So this year um, was able to work with them to identify programs um, for those sites, uh, for their part, uh, both of them are permaculture gardens, um, but how they could in fact uh, be expanded to begin to accommodate other uses, uh, as well as address some of the needs that um, each organization had identified. And so was able to organize a workshop for CCA students um, through the biennial and then charrettes in North Lawndale um, with anyone in North Lawndale that was interested um, on, for the MLK District Guard. And those were eventually pinned up in uh, the biennial itself. But to go through them quickly, uh, CCA Academy really just started this garden about um, two years ago. And so it's freshly planted primarily with fruit trees. Uh, they're really developing a master plan or the space relative to a master plan done by a SAIC students, uh, School of the Art Institute student um, in a class, a fourth year undergraduate architecture class. Uh, so here you can't see so much the trees on the image on the left, on the extreme left, you can see some small fruit trees and also a landscape berm that was put in place. Uh, and what they were interested in working uh, on was really a gathering space um, that could be used by uh, not only CCA students, but surrounding organizations, uh, and also that it could be a multi-generational meeting place. Uh, in that they were looking for this to begin to incorporate planting, I had invited Antonio Torres, uh, a colleague at UIC who's uh, architecture design work really begins to overlap with interest in kind of growable architectures in a way. Uh, so he led three workshops which CCA asked that we conduct at UIC uh, so that students would have the opportunity to see a university environment. Uh, UIC is about a mile and a half to two miles directly east of uh, North Lawndale, but a lot of the students have never really left North Lawndale so much. Uh, and then we did a fourth workshop that was looking, so that one, the first three focused primarily on the idea of a canopy and platform. Uh, the fourth looked more at the idea of collective spaces in general. Um, and so it was really more of an opportunity of, for them to speculate beyond just the immediate site. Uh, and from that, Antonio, I think really started to look at some of the ideas that they had introduced and develop a proposition. Um, which quickly here is this kind of platform that would go between the two trees that you see, the red circle. Um, but I think trying to pick up on um, the berm that is at the front of the site, and then also trying to introduce ways in which students could participate in the construction. So really introduce something that has these kind of mosaic furniture elements, uh, wood decking, berm. So really also trying to keep the construction pretty straightforward so they could participate as much as possible. Um, but I think trying to introduce, um, which is consistent with the idea of the exposition, um, trying to address some of the issues and concerns that um, the organizations have in some ways that could be surprising in terms of um, what it might look like. And in some ways too, what it, given what it looks like, how does that kind of uh, enact uh, greater use of the of, um, Perma Park? Uh, and I'll say the same for MLK Garden, to understand them not just as um, gardens, but to really begin to understand them as places that um, uh, one can visit for other, other uses as well. And in some ways, through that visit for other activity, you might learn a little bit more about gardening and healthy eating. So in some ways trying to establish some synergies between uh, what's the overall mission and how that mission might be promoted through other means beyond, or through the space itself, the collective space itself, rather than um, really just trying to always advocate about gardening that all of a sudden it can become multiple ways in which, there can be multiple ways in which one would learn about um, the garden and about healthy eating. Um, the challenge at MLK uh, District Garden, which you maybe see in the lower two images, is that the garden is quite full. Uh, if anything, it's maybe overly abundant in the summer. 
uh, when I say overly abundant, um, a lot of residents are hesitant to go inside, even though it is something that they are free to go into and um, harvest vegetables. Um, but a lot of them are intimidated because it can become overgrown compared to in the winter, you can see that it actually looks like it almost returns to a sense of abandonment. Um, and so they were really interested in how you could provide fencing that would help uh, create a kind of second identity in winter, uh, but also begin to uh, give a greater sensibility about where you would enter uh, and how you might begin to navigate. Um, so quickly that was, um, I asked um, Anya Jaworska, who's also a colleague at UIC, uh, and then somebody, uh, industrial designer at SEIC, Eric Hotchkiss, uh, to uh, work on the project. And in both cases, again, the selection of architects is in some ways through, is there a kind of commonality and in the interest in their work? And uh, perhaps what's the brief that's being described by the, the different groups? Um, and so we had three charrettes. Uh, the first one was, this is really a combo of two different charrettes, but really was walking through the garden and understanding what's there. Um, and then the second charrette um, was really to begin to develop ideas. I think all of us in, on the design side were surprised that the conversations did begin to spawn on the part of um, uh, the greening committee, a thought about how they would redesign the garden in general. Um, and so I think they used this as an opportunity to really reassess what were the successes in uh, emerging uses uh, and possibilities of the garden now that it had been around for about six years, I believe. Uh, and then the third charrette, um, there was a presentation of what it might look like and then further input by um, other residents and then also a walkthrough of the gardens. Um, so here you can see what they come, come up with are really less fences as much as um, three different gathering points along the perimeter. Uh, the upper one, the fire pit and the arch entry gate seating areas are really entry points in. The corner seating area doesn't allow you to go into the garden, but really relates to um, the drugstore across the street and the small market. And so trying to invent um, kind of casual usage. Uh, so. Uh, as well as those that are maybe interested in going into the garden itself, and then a small event area on the far side, or on the west side, uh, which could hold larger events. Um, so these are just some details of how that's developing, sorry. Um, and then a more recent project, through working on that project, I've also just gotten to know other individuals and other organizations and what they are looking to initiate. So have been involved with a project called Under the Grid from its start about a year ago. Um, and in this case, uh, we're, they're really looking at the potential of the uh, pink line um, as it runs through New North Lawndale across 15 blocks, primarily through residential blocks, but it also um, uh, passes through one of the major um, commercial corridors in the neighborhood as well. So how could this actually begin to be a kind of new um, pedestrian um, infrastructure? Um, and so we were able to organize um, in February, so about a month before everything um, shut down, uh, a large kind of what we called an urban hack, um, which was really where we uh, invited residents and other designers across the city um, to come in and try to speculate about all 15 blocks. Um, we also invited Walter Hood to come and give a talk, um, which in some ways we got greater attendance too for the talk. Um, and so even though there were 70 participants in the design, I think we maybe were up to about 100 for the talk itself. Uh, so that included just looking at the site, um, and then working on physical models, each table had designers as well as residents. Uh, and so then really afterwards we presented what were the ideas developed for all 15 lots. Uh, there were some kids that were working on some blocks. I think you notice there's one image, the fourth image has a gap. Uh, they were trying to actually pull the, 
the project away from the two children that were working on it and they were too busy having a good time continuing to develop it. So uh, they weren't able to secure it for this review. But I think in some ways what that helped reveal uh, is that you really could begin to think of this, I would say similarly to how I think about the available city that while here it presents a linear continuity, it really could be 15 different things. And so each uh, block could have host a different activity and it may be that the linearity is a secondary aspect of it or a kind of um, aspect that's prominent and primary for some while the locality of the individual block might be primary for others. Uh, and so our next step was to uh, look at um, the Central Park stop, which is pretty much in the middle of the line, and really look at the kind of trapezoid of space that's on the far right. Um, and so we were going to plan how that could be activated for this summer. But obviously that's gone into a kind of hiatus. The exposition as well, I was trying to get the spaces built and installed for this summer. Uh, and then host a set of events, but really uh, given Chicago winters and really now focusing on the possibilities for next spring. Um, and the same with, um, with under the grid that we really are trying to figure out ways in which we can continue to do outreach and um, charrettes that would talk about the possibilities of this site so that some things might be constructed this summer. Uh, and that would be a, through a combination of having outside charrettes online, which we're trying to test different ways to do that. Um, but coupled with, um, there are a couple of organizations that will be working with students this summer uh, that are in North Lawndale. And so how might uh, kind of online designers interact with those students that would actually potentially meet in place in small groups over the summer is something that we're looking at. I'm not gonna go into connect the boxes at length, but because it's really just in, a, in its initial stages, but uh, a lot of the gardens have um, shipping containers and they're starting to realize that those form a kind of network. Uh, and so part of the exposition would include charrettes that tries to look at what, how do you actually begin to manifest that as a network a little bit more. And I guess I just wanted to conclude with this one image, which was the prompt for students for the youth studio in terms of trying to, uh, for the CCA youth studio, in terms of trying to get them to think broadly about what collective space could be. And that includes, I eliminated the one thing they all were variously saying at one point or another, which is the basketball court. Uh, and then just trying to write a list that maybe help them to think outside of what they, either some things that they had experienced but could manifest differently. And then in some cases, perhaps, what are some other things that uh, they hadn't necessarily seen but uh, could imagine uh, to really prompt what is the potential of collective space um, and how that might uh, begin to uh, enable them to reimagine what their neighborhood could be. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, David. Yep, yeah, sorry. I'm no just worries. being slow about stopping sharing. No, oh, okay. no, no, you're good. So, um, thanks everyone. And, uh, you know, I, I want to say one of the things about inviting groups of people is the ways in which, of course, they take up your question and your prompts, um, follow them and then break all of your rules. Um, such that the way in which you think of them as um, a collective uh, sort of dissipates on the one hand and then reorganizes itself on the other. Um, because we, we have about 20 minutes left, I thought what I'd like to do is open up the conversation to our audience. I think we have about 50 additional participants with us. Um, and ask folks to do one of two things, perhaps. Uh, the first is either to um, type a message into a, a question into the chat, uh, which I can read out loud, or uh, get fancy and go into the participants list, uh, where at the 
bottom, you have the option to raise your hand and I can acknowledge your, your desire to ask a question and have you jump in there. Um, and then if you feel you absolutely must get a question in at that very moment, you can feel free to jump in, but I usually discourage that. But you know, I do like a certain amount of rule breaking and I am told that this does occasionally, this does actually work in the ACSA webinars. Um, while we're waiting for some questions, I thought I might just ask um, our presenters who, again, I want to collectively thank, um, if they have any questions to one another um, that might be pressing um, about either the work or the work within the current context, um, I'll say that I was really, um, um, I, I think one of the through through lines for me, which isn't one that I had anticipated was, although I should have, um, the whole issue with how you com communicate with various publics um, in this moment, particularly on projects and ideas um, that are um, about place. And I think that even extends to places journal, which isn't, which is purely about place, but exists almost entirely virtually, um, the ways in which it has also assembled new audiences and groups and ways of thinking as well. So um, I'll put that out there, unless folks have something else they wanna take up and again, encourage um, everyone else to type questions into the chat or raise their hands. Oh my. <laughs> Virgine, thanks. Hi, um, I have a question for Anya. Um, so Anya, I really enjoyed your presentation and I know that um, as a practitioner um, with our ongoing projects, I'm really, um, we're really trying to figure out how to do engagement and how to have um, meaningful engagement. And like Sharon was saying before, so much of what we've always done is uh, place-based. And so I'm curious, um, are you testing anything out? And um, how's it going? I was going to ask you the same question, Georgine. <laughs> no. <laughs> we are testing some things out. And um, we're, we're in, in progress. but. Um, at all junctures, we realize that there won't be a single solution and that it won't replace the things that we once did and, and imagined. I think that, um, you know, in the past, I've always thought about how engagement is on, only partial, that it's not quite a democratic process, uh, that the more extroverted of us come to the table and, you know, um, some folks are heard and then others are not. And, We've always struggled to figure out um, what the best platforms are. And we've always turned to programming as the platform that has carried the possibility of including both introverted and extroverted residents in conversation. Currently, um, we're working on a number of parallel strategies. One is um, spatializing a digital platform that would enable people to experience being together. It's modeled on something that we did at Taubman College for final reviews, which was called CMOK. And uh, that was designed with um, uh, graduates and uh, students and faculty to replicate the experience of being able to serendipitously jump into various conversations uh, and to move around topics and spaces as though we had some liberty in all of this. Um, it worked for the purposes of a final review, uh, but of course in the space of public design, um, I think what I mentioned in, in the earlier presentation, what do you do in a city where 40% of folks do not have access to those platforms? And so we're looking at partnering with libraries, creating stations where people can safely access some form of media, but also replicating analog spaces for distanced social encounter, 
on site um, and trying to stitch together some way of communicating in the future. But, you know, if, if, if we hit anything that works, I am delighted to share. Um, I do see that Robert Fishman has his hand up, raising his hand from New Jersey. <laughs> okay, thank you. Can, can you hear me or see me? Yes. Okay, great. Oh. Well, there's, uh, you know, there's so much that I'd love to comment on. Uh, you know, in terms of these projects, these wonderful projects that we've seen. But uh, I think like all of us, uh, I'm just obsessed with what's been happening over the last few days. And I want to challenge the, uh, uh, the panel in this way that I think that it's always been implicit that, you know, in any concept of public space that it be policed. And it's, you know, it's kind of, you know, uh, uh, behind behind the designs. And I think that one of the, one of the things that, that might be true about what has happened just recently is that uh, the, the, poli you know, the police power, even at its uh, brutal and violent, has been countered in a new way uh, by the ability you know, of the smartphone and so on to just show the violence as it's happening uh, directly and to, in a sense, to take that baton, you know, take that weapon out of the hands of the police, or at least to counter it. And I think that could have some tremendous implications for public space and its meaning, uh, especially if you have to assume, as I think we do, that, you know, in this post-pandemic era, that we're going to see uh, immense conflicts that ultimately are played out in the streets. I don't know, I don't know if anyone wants to take this up, but it's something I just had to say. Well, I would just respond briefly. Um, hi, Robert. Hello. Uh, you know, I think that one of the, I mean, this certainly raises the fact, the issue of needing really, really good journalism so that we sort out um, we sort out rumor from what is emerging as a, a record. But what, one of the things that's been really interesting is that the response of the police has been very varied. You know, I, did you notice that in Houston, the chief of police marched with the protesters? In other cities, you've seen police officers kneel down with protesters. So I think it's, it's been a very, very exciting thing to watch because it's, the response has been so heterogeneous. Georgine, I, I was wondering if I could just, um, since so much of the work of the arsenal is about ways in which space is policed, if you had any thoughts on that as well. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm just, it's been really an incredible, uh, just an incredibly um, sad uh, week. And um, I'm really, to tell you the truth, I'm really overwhelmed um, by uh, all of the different um, inputs. And, um, and, but I think that what I'm really, I, I mean, I, I want to try to answer the question directly, but I think one of the things that I've been thinking about is um, not so much about um, the the police, but really more about um, let's say like the social contract um, among humans and how that actually is a form of not a form of policing, but a form of um, it, it's well, yeah, it's a, a self a self policing. And so, like for example, you know, we've been having a lot of discussions about. Uh, so even before um, uh, uh, last week, you know, there's all this different type of signage that's popped up in New York City about like how you have to maintain um, six feet apart. And, and a lot of people have been thinking, well, this is a way in which uh, more people's rights are going to be taken away. And that's a real concern. But at the same time, a lot of um, these uh, new rules that have been emerging are 
actually um, asking people who occupy public space together to um, limit them limit themselves like so for example like in the park you're asked to maintain six feet from from others and so um, I guess what I've been really um, interested in is how people who have been participating um, in the protests the rightful protests how they have been communicating amongst themselves to shape behavior um, and it's not coming from the police. So that's something that I've been thinking about and it's not a kind of, um, it's not a kind of a clearly formulated thesis, but I think um, I'm of course terrified by the brutality, um, but I guess I'm also really interested in, in seeing how we, how people amongst, you know, in different groups work together to, um, have a different outcome. And so uh, it's not a kind of, a, it's, it's not a really, let's say, um, answer that is going to, you know, be a quick soundbite, but uh, that's what I've been thinking about. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I ask because um, I, I don't expect, I think that even in the several months that we've been dealing with just the issues of of space in addressing pandemic there's still this we don't know and then on top of this this almost like that moment when uh at least when this state went into lockdown when all of a sudden for days you heard not a car on the street and and so there in my own mind there's this almost this um, this 180 from the not not a sound of a car on a street to streets once again very full of people that are you know that are being um, policed in an entirely different way than they have been prior or an extension or more extreme version of ways in which things had happened in a kind of more um, um, dis, uh, dispersed way, I'll, I'll say. I do want to say that someone, Sarah Gamble, has uh, written with a, um, a link to a YouTube video of um, a virtual charrette um, for those who are wondering about some ideas there. And I don't know if folks can also see Lena Stergdew's question, which I think is a kind of broad one um, 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 I'm just don't know if anyone wants to sort of take that up as a kind of broad question about stakeholders and maybe I'll just think about it a little bit in terms of how does one start to think of locating stakeholders in a new kind of um, Way. I know that David has been sort of speculating a little bit about how one might literally go about being on the ground um, with community residents this summer. Yeah, I think um, I felt fortunate in kind of both of the both of the projects that um, in some ways I'd been working on kind of the relationships uh, for a while. So it's uh, in terms of different stakeholders and if anything it's now trying to to figure out um, or if anything I'm the one that's maybe more distant um, that like in particular with under the grid there are um, some of the key people that are helping to organize that effort one of them will be doing a working group with students and so that's where we can really begin to think about well uh, what are things that they might do um, uh, in North Lawndale on the site? Um, and even thinking about that we could set up workstations on the very lot that we're talking about that could be socially distanced and or one can um, draw on the site in chalk or various ways that they could, can start to test ideas and that those can get posted and if, if you then um, start to create links with um, 
invited designers and other stakeholders that really want to stay distant. Just how do you begin to set up interfaces between them? Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it's in part because there are the relationships. I think the one thing that is a kind of hurdle um, currently um, is that um, the person that's going to run the summer program has run these for about three summers now, but has typically interviewed um, potential students um, and not really sure about exactly how um, he's going to advertise um, and do the outreach besides kind of being able to perhaps go from word of mouth through students he's worked with in the past. So um, I think it is just trying to, to think through um, what are the, what are the different, um, different avenues that are available or you, um, to me, it's, um, I think to a lot of the, um, teachers, et cetera, in North Lawndale have been thinking through some of the same issues. So being able to kind of talk to them about how have they communicated or can they communicate. Mm -hmm. Then on the other side, I think in terms of the funding, um, I think given the location and kind of issues that are um, currently present, that it is really talking about what are the possibilities of the neighborhood. Um, I think the work that has already been done for through the charrettes will, is um, in a clear state of readiness. I think the summer was already going to be a push to get it done, um, but I think we will be able to more fully secure some of the funding. Uh, once, I don't know exactly when that's going to occur, but I think given, given um, the location and issues that it, I think those projects begin to address um, and that they do have price tags on them and a clarity about cost um, and potentially some overlap with the biennial that I think I can begin to find some of the funding a little bit more easily. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's in some ways, and I was, I think this morning I was in a meeting with the under the grid group and there was some hesitancy about should the project move forward. And I was saying one of the, one of the advantages is that it is a project that has a little bit of inertia already compared to something that's uh, fully being imagined um, as a starting point now. Uh, and so um, how do we take advantage of the fact that we do have these some some inertia in place uh, is just the thing that we're starting to think through. Um, and I, it's, that's a team that has diverse sets of contact, contact as well. So we are actually at 7.30. Nancy, do you, I'll, I, I'm gonna, Nancy, do you have a quick remark you wanna make? Was that the, or noting that we're at 7.30? <laughs> I actually do want to um, say something. I just, I, I wanted to answer Lena's question by saying, oh, good. Yeah. I think we have to look at public space as a function of politics and look at the issue of public responsibility. So in response to what Anya pointed out about 40% of the stakeholders that you're working with don't have access to broadband, that's a public problem. It shouldn't be just an individual problem. So, you know, here again, you just look at the history of we once electrified the country. So I think we need to, we need to look at, at it in a much bigger way and define things as public problems and not personal or private ones. Mm -hmm. so. Could I add one quick statement? Oh, I'm, 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 I'm cool, yeah. Robert really hit an, uh, a, a note that I think is so important currently, which is how do we project the relationship between technology, space making, communication, and race? the future and will this will our, our capacity to police the police change the power dynamics of course that same technology is what's responsible for surveillance mechanisms that improperly target um, people on the other side of that equation and this very week when uh, the tesla company shot a rocket into space that promises to uh, privatize even further aspects of our society that should be public. 
I think that we're in for a very rocky ride unless we begin to reclaim some of the basic civic infrastructure of our society and reclaim democratic process. I don't think that we're going to get ourselves out of this mess very easily, but I really appreciated your question, Robert. Any additional closing thoughts? I, I think that's a really good place to um, to perhaps end being somewhat mindful as well of, of you know, the, the space of surveillance that is also Zoom and the way in which we communicate um, as being a kind of um, an extension of what one form of surveillance in physical space, which now really extends both from the public into the private, um, which I think is also another aspect of things to think about in relationship to this. Um, but I, I want to thank all of our panelists for their presentations um, for a set of really um, provocative ideas um, and ways perhaps of thinking or just being having a willingness to not yet be able to think to the future. Um, and also note that the, the, um, this event has been recorded, so feel free to um, also um, invite others to, to watch this um, in the future. And again, I wanna thank Mike and uh, Carol from the ACSA and all the rest of the staff for not only making this particular webinar possible, but also for um, really pulling together an incredible number of webinars and discussions over the last several months such that we can all um, really engage in a conversation with one another.